We'll go ahead and get things kicked off. It's 2.01, so thank you all for being here for the seminar. So I am very uh, happy to introduce Stephen Young. He is a, a mathematician and researcher who works over at Pacific Northwest National Lab. So he did, he did his PhD in algorithms, uh, combinatorics, and optimization, or at the Georgia Institutes of Technology. He's been at the National Lab for a little less than a decade now, right? So he leads a team of researchers who work on algorithms, common parts, and optimization, and a lot of cool applications to data science. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Let's welcome Stephen. Thank you all for inviting me. Um, and so before I, I delve too deep into what I want to do, I want to introduce sort of show some of my the teams these are on. These are for, This is really sort of the synthesis of ideas from uh, two different projects with very different application areas, but uh, still developing a tool that's sort of common between both of them. So one of these is the is a TDAC project. Um, the primary collaborators on this are Salon Oxoy, uh, Sanan Oxoy, Allison Bittner, and, and Bill Kay. And then the team is part of a bigger uh, interdisciplinary team. And then uh, a second project, which is uh, we, we call internally Rosinante. Um, you could choose whether it's a sci-fi reference or a reference to uh, literature, uh, but it has a, a bunch of HVC people, chemistry, machine learning, and mathematicians working together on this project. So, so for, for very different fields, we are coming at sort of the same sort of motivation. So um, since this is a somewhat network science talk, I am sort of contractually obligated as a pseudo network scientist to show this graph. Uh, this is the Zachary Karate Club. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it is a karate club from the 70s, uh, investigated by the anthropologist William Zachary. Um, and the interesting thing about it was that going through their historical records and interviews, he was able to construct this network that sort of modeled their interactions over time. And the time happened to be interesting. He got sort of lucky. The club was undergoing a split. Uh, basically, the instructor wanted to charge more money, and the club president, who was a student at the student body, was like, no, don't charge more money. And they argued back and forth about whether you should charge more money, and eventually they split into two uh, different groups. Uh, one of them organized around the instructor, and then one of them organized around the club president. And it turned out that Zachary was able to use graph theoretic techniques, max flow, min cut, uh, to do a pretty good job of predicting just from the structural information who um, who would join which faction, right? Like, okay, structurally, this makes sense that they would join the instructor. And in here, it sort of gets a little fuzzy. But he was able to use graph techniques to predict that. So that's sort of one story of the genesis of network science. Okay, here's something completely different. Uh, so this is an image from a simulation of water molecules in a box. You can sort of wrap the periodic conditions. And so they, what you want to do is you want to understand how these water molecules move around over time. Uh, it's maybe not water molecules. Uh, maybe it is uh, electrical ions in some sort of metal system, but it, it matters in terms of molecular properties that I actually don't understand, being a mathematician, not a chemist. But the idea is you look at the current configuration and you calculate the energy potential of that current configuration, so how much energy is sort of in the system. And then you uh, calculate a gradient descent direction because these systems tend to flow towards states of lower energy. And then you update the configuration like that. And so this gives you a model of how the molecules move. So you could use this something for like protein folding in some sort of medium. You can use it in a variety of different things. And this is a broadly uh, studied and worked on area in chemistry called molecular dynamic simulations. And then obviously you reverse around and get back to use a new configuration. You do a new energy calculation, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, this calculation is really expensive to do from first principles. Right there's because you are having to deal with if you did everything to 100% accuracy, you're having to do with n squared electrical interactions. So you got to calculate the distances and how those fields do and how those fields translate on everything else. So it ends up being very expensive. So there's a lot of effort in trying to 
shortcut this, you know, make it faster or quicker. Um, because really, I don't care about this. I care about how the molecules are moving. And so if you could just get an approximate energy calculation with an approximate lower energy state, you would get, you would still be able to get what you're, where you're trying to actually go. Um, the, but the nice thing is that this is sort of, depends relatively smoothly on the position, right? So if I move this atom a little bit or this molecule a little bit, atom, sorry, uh, a little bit, the energy shouldn't move too much. The descent direction shouldn't move too much. So it's sort of, it's a nice smooth thing, but it just happens to be very hard to count. Okay, so now I'm gonna show how graphs and in particular Laplacians can address both of those issues. Uh, but I wanna first uh, review some common matrices for graphs and sort of talk a little bit about their properties. So the adjacency matrix is just a zero one matrix where the zeros and code, code that, encode non-edges and the ones encode edges D is just a diagonal matrix, which counts the degree or the number of connections associated with a vertex. And so you get these three matrices, the adjacency matrix, the combinatorial Laplacian, and the normalized Laplacian. And they all have uh, somewhat different properties and different uses. Uh, sort of to illustrate this, just what can you tell from the spectral information of these graphs? Well, from the adjacency matrix, you can't tell the number of connected components because these two graphs correspond to matrices that have exactly the same spectrum. And one of them has two connected components and the other one has none, or has one, excuse me. Um, but for the combinatorial Laplacian and the normalized Laplacian, you just count the, the dimension of the zero eigenspace and that gives you how many connected components the graph has. Is it bipartite? Well, for adjacency matrix, if the set symmetric, if the spectrum is symmetric around zero, it's bipartite. For normalized Laplacian, if it's symmetric around one. But for the combinatorial Laplacian, uh, if you look, here's a three cycle in this one. So this one is not bipartite, but this one has no odd cycle. So it is bipartite, but they are co-spectral. Volume, how, much, how many degrees there are, how many edges? So it's sort of equivalent ways of doing this. So adjacency. Do yes. you mean the, the, the left plot is not a bipartite and the right plot is bipartite or is that both? Yes. So the left block is not bipartite because there's a three cycle. So it has an odd cycle. And the right block is bipartite because all the cycles are even. So what's the definition of bipartite? Is this mean that like the, if you do the coloring, you can only use two, two kind of colors? Is this yeah, the you definition? can use two colors. That, that's one definition of bipartite. So on the right, if you color these three ones red, and the top one, bottom one, and, and the one on the right blue. What's the trick you tell the left is not? Uh, I have this triangle right here. So if I try to color this red and this blue, oh. this one would have to be a third color. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to know the volume or the sum of the degrees or the number of edges, these are all sort of affinely related. For the adjacency and the combinatorial Laplacian, adjacency, I take the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues. Combinatorial Laplacian, I take the sum of the eigenvalues, but for the normalized Laplacian, if you look, this has three edges, this has four edges, and they're co-spectral. So you can't distinguish between those two. How about the number of spanning trees? Well, again, we have the from combinatorial problem, we have the Kirchhoff matrix tree theorem, which is a famous resulting graph theory. But again, using the same sets of examples. This has no spanning tree, this has one, this has one, this has four. So it can't, so depending on your application or what you're interested in, you might use different matrices to represent your graph. Uh, and I'm really gonna focus on the two on the right, uh, Laplacian matrices, because there is a, a part of what we wanna talk about is unifying those two so we have sort of a common framework. Between. Okay, so one thing that Laplacians typically get used for is spectral clustering. And there's a bunch of different variants of spectral clustering, but the easiest one is take the eigenspace for associated with zero, throw it out. Take the next eigenspace, sort the vertices by that, and divide it into in some sort of natural way, oftentimes positive and negative. That's the simplest way we're doing it. That's what I'm talking about here. So if I do that, 
and from the combinatorial Laplace refers to Zachary Paddock Club, all of the green vertices have one side and all of the blue vertices have the other side. And the only vertex I mess up on is that one right there. And this is sort of why it's like, well, ah, that, that's, that's pretty impressive that I just, I, I wrote it on a matrix, I took an eigenspace, and I got almost everything right. That's not bad. Uh, if I do the normalized Laplacian, if you notice, nothing changed because it actually gets the positive and the negative the same, but it's the same story. Okay, so why, why would he even expect that to happen? Um, so I want to talk about some things that are uh, applied to both normalized and combinatorial Laplacian, but I'm going to express them primarily in the normalized Laplacian. One of them is the conductance and the Cheeger inequality. So the conductance of a set, so this set X, is the number of edges crossing the set, so going from one end in here, one end outside of X, divided by the volume, the number of edges that touch the set. So edges entirely in the side of the set count twice, edges with one end point in the set count once. And you take the min over that and it's complement just so you don't get sort of weird behavior on the other side. Okay, so uh, if we calculate it, okay, here's the red edges crossing the cut, there's 12 of them, and if you take the time to count up the volume of the other side, it's 48, so the, the conductance of this particular cut is 12 over 48. But the interesting thing is we have this Cheeger inequality, which says that if I minimize over all sets X of the conductance, it's bounded below by a function of the second, second small eigenvalue and above by a function of the second small eigenvalue. So the second smallest eigenvalue gives you control over how much, how many edges have to come out of every neighborhood. Okay, so now you can start to see why spectral clustering starts to work, right? Because the spectrum is telling you, the eigenvalue at least is telling you something about how able you are to split uh, the graph into two pieces. Uh, so a, a similar sort of result um, is known as the expander mixing lemma. Uh, my postdoc advisor uh, objects to this term for this result because it's not about expanders, it's not about mixing. Um, so, but it, it's just, it's the name that's stuck um, and the names she prefers are hard to Google. Expanding mixing lemma is pretty easy to Google, so I, I, I tend to use this. But basically what it says is, how many edges should I have between two sets, X and Y? I've drawn them as disjoint, but they don't have to be disjoint. Well, it should be about this val value. Um, if you look at it a little bit, you can sort of say, well, this is how many edges have endpoints in X, this is how many edges have endpoints in Y. And so you would sort of expect, like, if I take an R, one of these endpoints, one of these edges in X, and ask what's the probability of the other ends in Y, it's sort of like the volume of Y over the volume of G, right? It's how many endpoints live in Y. Yeah. yeah about your comment, this is not a, a neither expander nor mixing. But I think this is both the expander and the mixing because it's a, this is from the expander graphs like a structure. Expander graph is the second largest eigenvalue of pseudo value. This is less than or equal to lambda. The qualified data is this is the expander graph. And the mixing is about its rules, like a, some structure. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Not necessarily expanders. I, I just, you know, in case Fan watches this, I want her to not come yelling. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so basically what's it saying is, okay, this number of edges between X and Y deviates from some idea of what you should expect by some term that's kind of a mess, but controlled by lambda, which is a, a function of the spectrum. Uh, it's not really important what the function of the spectrum is. So you can sort of see it, and it is not the same as the Cheeger inequality. If you start looking at it and playing with it, put X and X bar, it ends up with different results. So it's the spectrum in multiple different ways gives you control on how edges leave sets. Okay, so let's talk about student nine, the student we got wrong. 
So if you go back and read Zachary's uh, paper, there's actually a story behind student nine. Student nine was this close to getting his black belt. It was almost there. And the new club was going to switch to a different type of karate. So he could go with the instructor, get his black belt in relatively short order, or switch to the new, stay with the club who he sort of wanted to be associated with and start all over it at probably the white belt, right? So it was not so much the combinatorial information that's telling you where he goes. It's some sort of external information that we really can't incorporate into this combinatorics picture. So the question is, how can we effectively incorporate that information? Because there's a lot of situations where we have that information. So for example, if I'm doing clustering on social networks, I don't just have, you know, I'm friends with you, you're friends with this other person, or I follow this person on Twitter slash X, but I also have a bunch of metadata. I have, maybe I have, if it's Facebook, your age, where you went to school, what your hobbies are, what other groups you follow that are people, or Twitter, maybe I have the context of all your top tweets and what tweets you've retweeted. Like I've got this other information that is not combinatorial and really should in inform my clustering. If I'm throwing it, that away, I'm really doing probably a pretty bad job of clustering because it's not just the structural information that's important, it's the non-structural information. So we'd like to be able to find a way of incorporating structural and non-structural information in our clustering techniques. Okay, so put a pin in that for right now and come back to this molecular dynamic simulation. So if you look at the some of the modern ways of doing this, uh, unsurprisingly, they type, like to use machine learning models. So basically what you do is you train a neural network to given the molecular, the atom positions, return an estimate of the potential, and then you use back propagation to recover the deter or for recover the descent direction. So basically, you're using the neural network as a a function that maps positions to energy, and so then if you take the derivative, you get what you want in terms of the descent direction, and then you update the configuration. So you have to spend a lot of time training this neural network and doing some initial calculations, but then you could do the ND simulations much faster. And because as I mentioned earlier, it is relatively smooth, there's reasons to think that the neural network should actually do a pretty good job. Uh, just in case, you know, maybe with this audience, it's everybody's fairly familiar with it, but uh, just in case, what is a neural network? Basically two stages. You do an affine function of a vector, AX plus B, where A and B are trained parameters, and then you do a nonlinear activation function applied component-wise. So maybe it's uh, rectified linear units, or Rayleigh, which basically says, hey, if it's zero, I keep oh, above zero, keep the value, otherwise make it zero. Or maybe it's a, a soft plus, which is take the values and sort of smooth out the Rayleigh if maybe you don't like the sharp points. Uh, Training, the training process for this is you take, you have some training data, you evaluate your current state of the neural network, and then you do gradient descent essentially to uh, move all the uh, parameters, right? There's hundreds of thousands of millions of parameters in this neural network to the right thing, and you have some fancy methods to be able to do this. Uh, Essentially, it boils down to regression under an unknown basis, right? I can't write down what basis it's doing it on, over. It's sort of, it's regression, the output of this deep neural network. But you really can think about it at, from a mathematical point of view. It's just regression under a basis I can't write down. Um, so what does the, for the water molecule, or really sort of the MD simulation, what does this sort of state of the art um, neural network looks like. It's something called SHNET. Uh, it has this sort of multi-stage. So this embedding stage is takes the atom properties and learns a hidden representation of them. And then it runs three interaction layers 
And those interaction layers are use what's called a graph convolutional neural network, where the graph is based on the closeness. Basically, you say if two atoms are close enough, we're going to say they interact electrically, and otherwise we're just going to throw away that connection. You know, it's going to decay like some sort of inverse square law, and so eventually it really doesn't matter. Um, and so then you repeat that three times, and then you get hidden states at all the, the atoms, and then you do a neural network to get out an edge. Uh, so what does that graph convolutional layer look like? So it's, it's building a graph and then doing a convolutional layer. So it has uh, a couple of pieces, right? The nonlinear activation function, right? Lou, soft plus, tan H, whatever you want to use. It has a graph representation. Uh, very commonly, it's a shift of the normalized Laplacian, right? So this, right, if you remember back to the beginning, d to the minus one half a, d to the minus one half, if we put an i minus in front of that, that's the normalized Laplacian. And so it's just basically shifting the spectrum of that. Those are the inputs to the layer or X, and W is some sort of trained weight matrix. So we can think about this in a slightly different way by using the fact that this matrix, it's symmetric, and so it's Hermitian, and so the spectral theorem applies, and we can write it as a linear combination or a convex combination of rank one matrices, right? So you write it as the eigenvalues, and these are uh, orthonormal eigenvectors, and so you can write it as this sum of outer products, or if you want to think about it more like an SVD because it's symmetric, you can write it as U diagonal U transpose, right, where U is orthonormal. Okay, so I could just drop that in, right, just a different phrasing, it doesn't change anything, but now if I start thinking about this, well, okay, I have my inputs, and I have my W parameter, what is W doing? Well, if you think about matrix matrix products, what it's doing is basically taking the input vectors and mixing them together, and then taking another mixture and another mixture and another mixture. Okay, so we have a mixing term. And then we do a change of basis, right? That's all the U transpose is doing, is it's changing the basis functions. And then stretch and contraction, and then because we change basis, we should probably go back to the original basis. Okay, so this pre-multiplication by the shift in normalized Laplacian can be thought of as acting in the Fourier basis, right? You're saying normally we have the indicator functions of the index of the you know e1, e2, e3, e4. That's the basis we're working in. This is saying, hey, let's use the basis functions associated with a normalized Laplacian of a graph. And so that's where a lot of the power of a graph convolutional layer is coming from is the fact that it's doing something in a better basis. But what if we could construct an even better basis than the one given by the graph? Well, well what would that look like? So let's take, you know, one of my favorite molecules, caffeine. Caffeine, caffeine. You can see how I get my caffeine. I get it from coffee. Uh, so here's the caffeine molecule, and if I was going to do uh, a graph neural network, that would be the graph I would get, and that's all the information I have. But, right, like, we have all these chemists who know things about molecules and, and have spent a lot of time knowing things about molecules that I don't know about molecules. And they would tell us, well, you're ignoring a bunch of inf important information. These are hydrogens. That's a carbon. That's a nitrogen. There's an oxygen over there. So it would be really nice if somehow our Fourier basis could encode the similarity between these molecules, can encode that this is really, sorry, atoms, that these are really hydrogen atoms, that these others are oxygen atoms. Those are similar in some way. And that similarity should be important to calculating electrical potentials. But there's even more, right? Like these are double bonds and these are signal bonds and those are different. Somehow I should encode that like this is more like this than something over here, right? I'm sharing two electrons between these two atoms here as opposed to one electron in the, between those two atoms here. So, so that should be important information to encode. 
And so let's let's just make up a, a, a way of encoding that by just saying, hey, I'm going to say how similar these things are. Uh, I'm going to use, say, I'm just going to use the inner product notation because machine learning cosine similarity is kind of an inner product. And so I just made up some numbers just as, as examples and say, okay, well, if I knew this information that oxygen was is similar with itself at a value of eight, but hydrogen was only similar with itself as a value of one, somehow maybe there's something useful there that I should be able to do and, and improve the performance of this graph convolutional neural network. So the idea is, so take a graph, which we have, and some notion of similarity among the edges, and some notion of the similarity among the vertices, and somehow combine those together to get a better basis for this Fourier transform. Okay. Before I answer how we're going to do that, I want to take a detour through simplicial homology. So K up here is a simplicial complex. All it means, if that means, is a collection of subsets that's downwardly closed. So since ABC is in there, that means AB, AC, BC, A, B, and C all have to be in there. And then we don't worry about the empty set because that's in every set, so I just throw it out. But the nice thing is I can also think about this geometrically. So what I could do is say, well, ABC is in there, so that's really this filled-in triangle. But if you notice, BCD is not, so I'm not having that filled-in triangle. But now if I look A, B, A, C, B, C, D, D, C, D, right? So those are those edges around here. And then A, B, C, and D are the vertices. So you can view this as a geometric, a simplicial complex as a geometric object. And if I was a better artist, you could imagine a tetrahedron as a, as a four set sort of going down. And then if I could see in an extra dimension, you could do a five set and so on. Okay, so it's very common to identify in uh, simplicial homology what are known as boundary maps or signed boundary maps. And what basically those do is this takes this triangle and goes to its boundary. So the triangle ABC goes to AB, AC, and BC. And there's a signing rule uh, that's not really important, but it is signed. Well, I could go ahead and write those down as nice little matrices that are not square. So ABC goes to one AB, a minus one AC and a one BC, and then no BDs and no CDs. And then I could do the same thing for the two element subsets to the one element subset. So they map, really what's, what's the boundary of the geometric object, right? What's the boundary of an edge? It's the two vertices. What's the boundary of a triangle? It's the three edges. Okay, and so now what I wanna do is I wanna break this simplicial complex into layers by the size of the sets call them for historical reasons, zero, one, and two, the level zero, one, and two, and I can build a, uh, a group by former linear combinations of the elements. So if I have K zero, right, I could A, B, C, D, I could take all formal linear combinations of those elements, and that is a group, right? I can add them together, I have a zero, et cetera. But then, what are these deltas? These are maps between those groups. And really, they're homomorphisms between those groups. So now I can start using some of the group and algebraic topology tools to understand them. Um, and so from those, we can define what are known as Hodge Laplacians, which are basically just matrices. And there's going to be one for each level. and you basically are chasing these uh, these actions, right? You're going up and down or down and up to chase through these boundary maps, right? And so you also have the edge adjoint boundary map going back, right? So I can map from C1 to C0 using delta 1, and then I use delta 1 adjoint to map from C0 to C1. And I can define these matrices. But that actually happens to be the combinatorial Laplacian. The L0 Hodge Laplacian is exactly the same as the common formula Laplacian. So let's go back to what if I had extra information? Now I have extra information that these are colored. 
I have orange and blue and yellow and red and green. And maybe I have a similarity. Well, blue is one the same as blue. Blue and orange, well, they're very opposite, so they must be minus one. Uh, and blue and yellow, maybe they're kind of similar, but still opposite, so they're minus 0.5. Again, I just made up these numbers, so they don't take any deep meaning to it. So I could do similarity scores. Again, if I'm thinking similarity scores, I should be thinking inner products. And so now I have an inner product on the indeterminates determined by everything in my simplicial complex. And it turns out that any inner, finite inner product, real inner product, can be represented by a positive uh, fix a basis, and then it can be represented by a positive definite matrix. That positive definite matrix has a square root that happens to be symmetric. You can choose a square root that's not symmetric, but there is a unique symmetric square root. Okay, so now I have these indeterminates here, this, this what's known as a chain complex in simplicial homology based on this simplicial complex. But I also have maps down to these inner product spaces given by however I define an inner product on the one sets, the two sets, the three sets, et cetera. Well, from a mathematical point of view, the natural thing is, well, why don't I map along these, the Zs? And what am I going to choose? I'm going to choose this, the, the maps so that that diagram commutes. So that Z1 to Z0 is the same as going Z1 to C1 to C0 to Z0. Z2 to Z1, that Q2 map is the same as going up to C2, over to C1, and then down to Q, down here. And then I can also define these adjoint maps, which unlike before where they were just the transpose, right? Under the standard basis, the adjoint, under the standard inner product, the adjoint is just a transpose. These are not actually transposes. They are, uh, you have to do a little bit more work to get the adjoint. And so now I can define inner product Hodge Laplace. So I take my Q1, Q1 transpose. So and that gives me an inner product Hodge Laplace. Okay. What are some things that you might want out of this? Well, they're still positive definite because of their positive semi definite, actually, because of their structure. Uh, so you get the spectral decomposition and you get all the nice things about working with positive definite matrices and the Carl Fisher Files theorem, the decomposition of the eigenspaces. So the eigenspaces are really nice to work with. It generalizes the normalized Laplacian, the combinatorial Laplacian, the combinatorial Laplacian for weighted graphs, the combinatorial normalized Laplacian for weighted graphs. All of those are given by just choosing an appropriate inner product space on the vertices and edges. So for the normalized Laplacian, or sorry, the combinatorial Laplacian, you just choose the standard inner product space. For the weighted combinatorial Laplacian, you choose the inner product space where the weight of an edge is it's the norm squared of an edge is just its weight and all the edges are orthogonal. And then for the normalized Laplacian, your uh, vertex inner product space is given by either the degrees or the weighted degrees if you're in the weighted degrees. So it generalizes all four of those. This is a common framework for all four of them. Uh, there's also a, a weighted simplicial complex, a Laplacian, the Horak and Joseph defined. It generalizes that as well. Uh, connected components are still counted by the dimension of the zero eigenspace. Um, for those who are familiar with the simplicial homology, it's not spectrally invariant under the boundary map signings. We, there was those signings, and we had a choice. If you change your choice for the normalized and all these others, it doesn't change the spectrum of the Laplacian. Here it does. Uh, so that sort of complicates some of the results we would like to get, right? You could say, well, which signing did I choose? Well, now I have to say for any signing, and that makes it a little bit more complicated. Uh, it preserves the double boundary property, so the boundary of the boundary of these boundary maps is zero. That's just something that's important in spatial homology. Uh, and the co-boundary operators sort of going the other way, going up, um, are basically you can get to by inverting the inner product space. But so let's go back to some of these inequalities, right? Like I could define a thing, that doesn't mean it's useful. Uh, so what about the, uh, 
inner product, inequality for inner product. What about the uh, the Cheater inequality? So the zero eigenspace, we can just write down explicitly, already, just like we can for the normalized Laplacian and the combinatorial Laplacian. And then we can do a Rayleigh-Ritz formulation of what is lambda two. It's the thing orthogonal to the zero eigenspace that minimizes this Rayleigh quotient. Uh, you can actually choose this so that it is basically you can say what uh, slightly change the Rayleigh quotient so that you're minimizing over things that are orthogonal inside the vertex inner product space to the all ones factor. And so mimicking what is done for the regular proof of the Cheeger inequality for a set X, we define some test function, one X minus some constant times the indicator of the complement. And then you could start running that through and you could say, okay, well, what is this part? Well, it can be thought of as the volume of the edges between. And this part can be thought of the volume, sort of some combination of those volumes plus this sort of diagonal term, right? If you think about if my vertex, my vertices are orthogonal, that term drops out, but here it's not going to. And so you've got to have a good way of dealing with that. And that's where a lot of the complexity lies, but you can deal with that and get something that very precisely generalizes the Cheeger inequality, the upper bound on the Cheeger inequality in this case. Uh, I don't really want to chase through what happens in the expander mixing lemma. I do want to just sort of, now you got to worry about all these different signs and some of them are different. And so you sort of split your, your argument into a lot of different cases. Um, haven't quite resolved this yet, but I think we're close. Um, but you have sort of like, now I have this is plus and this is minus, this is minus, this is plus, and now I have some minuses that are dangling out here. Oh, but these edges can interact with these edges, and so I've got this off-diagonal term issue. So it just gets a lot more complicated, but it's we're probably 75%, 83% through the proof, and it looks like it'll all work out. So there's still, still some details to resolve. Uh, so coming back to Zachary, well, okay, I can't really make it. I don't know how to make an inner product space that encodes. I'm really close to my black belt, but I can do it in other contexts. So this is uh, the operationally transparent cyber data. It's a DARPA data set uh, released for cybersecurity. It's if you Google or OptC, you can find a, a GitHub repo with it that has some explanation of it, and then. They link you to a Google Drive. And basically what uh, DARPA did is they instrumented several um, systems and simulated several more and did a, an attack on it. And you can see they recorded every registry edits, shell commands, threads, creation. They really instrumented these systems so that you got all the data from it. Now, if you think about it, so if I'm going to try and do you know, say spectral clustering on this. I've got to somehow turn this mess of data into a graph, which is not exactly clear. And then I've got to deal with something, all the stuff that isn't combinatorial. So, and it's most of it. If you look and you start thinking about it, it's like, well, okay, flow, yeah, okay, that's that's combinatorial. Flow, more details, combinatorial. But process, registry, task, user session, those are all sort of non-combinatorial data. And so as a proof of concept, what do we do? So I'm just going to throw it in an auto encoder. So this is a particular type of uh, deep neural network, which basically you take the input is a certain size, and then the next layer, it's smaller, it's smaller, it's smaller. So you get to something in the middle, and then you grow it back out. And how you train it is you try and make the input max match the output. So you can think about it sort of as a projection, right? It's mapping it down to a solar space that hopefully incur encodes enough information that you can reconstruct the input. Okay, so what did we do for the autoencoder? For all these green events, we just said, count how many times they happened in the window. Um, and then for the yellow events that are like, they have like image path and key and it's like, things that like which registry key you modify. Well, maybe that's important. So we basically did a, a one hot style encoding. Here's all the registry keys that were modified in the data set. Which one of these were modified? Okay, put a one there. Oh, it was modified twice, put a two there. Okay. 
Is this the right thing to do? Probably not. It is a thing to do. Okay, and then we did it and then clustered it into two pieces. So uh, red and blue are the extremes of the second eigenvalue. So you can see that this blue, which is cis client 0201, uh, is at one extreme. It's unclear where the other extreme is. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. This is cis client 402. Uh, the edges drawn are um, the, uh, are the, the connections, those combinatorial pieces of information. So as you start looking at this, well, if you look, I've got blues and reds over here, blues and reds over here, but this is clearly the combinatorial cut. This is the sparsest cut, right? So whatever it did, it was not combinatorial, right? It, it produced a partition from spectral clustering, which did not correspond to the combinatorial spectral clustering partition. Okay, and then you start digging into it, right? You can also do an autoencoder and then cluster on the geometric information in the autoencoder, right? So uh, that's a little bit harder to depict. We just stared at the data. It's like, no, this is not respecting what's coming out of the autoencoder. So in some sense, it's doing both in the fact that it's doing neither, right? So is this the right one? Almost certainly not. Is this an important cut? Almost certainly not. However, it is showing that this approach leads to new things, something that we couldn't get at before. Now, there's a lot of questions about what the right inner product space is, and that depends on what type of clustering you want to have, and then how does that play in with the graph and the edge inner product space in these cases. Uh, by the way, this is taken from a 30-minute window where SysPlient 021 and SysPlient 042 uh, were both um, malicious actors at the time and doing a ping sweep over the network. So they started, the, the, the red team started at 201, was doing a ping sweep, pitted it in to 042, 0402, and then continued the ping sweep. That's why graphically it looks like that. Okay, so now go back to the other use case, chemistry, right? GNNs with edge inner products. So uh, you have the graph pieces, which are these boundary matrices. You have an edge inner product in the middle. And then on the outside, you have the vertex inner product that we need to define to be able to do this graph convolutional there. So going back to Schnett, this is another way of thinking about what's going on. So you get fed in the atom positions and you generate a geometric graph that gives you an interaction graph and feeds into the graph convolutional layer. You also are handed your, the atom types, which are embedded in some meaningful manner and get a hidden state. And then the graph convolution feeds, there's a circular loop here, and then you drop out with the energy calculation. The problem is uh, talking to chemists who, who have used Schnett and trained it, this, is, this embedding is actually one of the harder parts to train for some reason. It just takes it a while. I mean, it kind of makes sense. You're giving, you're saying, this is molecule A. Now I need you to know everything electrically about molecule A without me telling you anything about molecule A other than it's not molecule B. You can kind of see why any sort of regression procedure would struggle with that. Uh, and then there's like, what is what are these hidden states? They're not like meaning anything, they're just, hidden states in the middle somewhere. So it sort of lacks interpretability what it's doing. And then if you think about it, so I, I get a hidden state, I build a graph, and then I feed this into the graph convolutional network. And then I go through again and again. But the atom types only come in in this initial hidden state. So as I'm going down the path here, I sort of lose more and more information about what the atoms are. That seems unfortunate. Seems inefficient, at least, right? Like, it should be like every time I'm thinking about interactions, I should be able to say, oh, I know what those two atoms are that I'm worried about the interactions. So it seems like there's a lot of opportunities uh, to improve this. Um, but there's some, some challenges. Uh, if we're gonna replace that embedding in hidden space with some sort of inner product that encodes the similarities of the molecules, 
don't really have anything to put in initially into the neural network, right? That's, we go back, right? That's where the initial hidden state came from that I iterated on. So I've got to, we've got to figure out how this should be initialized. What is the right inner product from subject matter expertise, right? They know a lot of things about those atoms. What are important for these energy calculations? So one of the things is that uh, that we've, that's been brought up and we've talked about a lot is right like part of the efficiencies of it is you can do a message passing interface. You don't have to pass one hidden state to all the other vertices in the graph convolutional network. You just use the graph structure, and so you sort of minimize how much interactions. Well. You may not have realized it, but if you start thinking through what the inner product Laplacian is going to look like, yeah, it's probably going to be a dense matrix, even if you start out with a sparse graph. Maybe there's some way of doing that. Um, what about on the edges? How, how should I really actually, like, two edges that are here, these are, these are this molecule and this molecule are close together. How should I measure the similarity of, of that? There's, there doesn't seem to be a great way to do that. Maybe there is, I don't know. Uh, we've got some ideas and we're still working through that. Um, hopefully within the next month or so, we'll have like a sample run group. Like we guessed something for an inner product on the vertices and edges and we're able to do it and train it and this is what we got. But you can imagine this opens up a whole nother area of exploration for spectral graph theory, right? You can, all of these tasks sort of have spectral aspects or have spectral approaches, but now I can maybe have motifs, but not just triangles, but triangles that are special in some way with respect to an inner product or do link pred prediction, right? If you're thinking about social networks, these people are similar because they're similar in the inner product space I've built on the vertices and they have a short path. Well, that is probably a good suggestion rather than Facebook's approach, hey, these two people were in the same room together at some point and I grabbed their geolocation. Yeah, it kind of works, but... So you, you start to think like, okay, you've introduced a lot more challenges, right? How do you define all these inner product spaces? But now you've got a lot more opportunity to get better results by actually using domain knowledge or specialist knowledge to inform some of the decisions you want things to make uh, otherwise. Um, and you can apply this to other graph neural network tasks as well, right? So Schnett is essentially learning a function. It seems maybe to be that like the inner product Laplacian might be better for classification. Like these two things are similar because we're sort of adding in similarities. Maybe we could extend this to hypergraphs. I'm not sure what that looks like at this point. You know, you sort of have the simplicial complex framework. So maybe somehow you could build something meaningful there. All right, thank you very much for your time.